So we're going to talk about Augur, V2, and kind of beyond what's after that as well. So I'm going to start pretty abstract. Uh, so the way I think about this is, or the way I think about the whole kind of DeFi space is sort of similar to the printing press. So if you think about how dissemination of information worked prior to the printing press, it was really difficult. If you wanted the world to know about something, um, well, you could hire like town criers, you could try to spread the word, uh, but getting information out was actually really hard. And after the printing press was created, uh, people could basically print content about whatever they wanted. And the cost for it dropped a lot. And it became pretty easy to create content on anything. Uh, so not only creation of content was transformed, but so was consumption of content. And everyone knows the story with the internet basically did the same thing. Um, if 20 years ago you said you know, that people will post photos of food online and their friends will like them and comment on it, uh, that would have been viewed as very crazy. I think DeFi is sort of the same thing about what I'm going to talk about is sort of, I think, in that category of crazy. And so if I think about Augur, the sort of like why we're here is basically to provide universal access to tools that can help kind of protect wealth through finance and betting. So you think of financial markets, derivatives, et cetera, they allow hedging, which allows people to basically manage their risk much more easily. And where we're going to start is a very kind of segmented area, which is betting. So we're creating the world's most accessible no-limit betting platform. And if you think of prediction markets, they're pretty simple. They're financial markets where you can speculate on anything, uh, any future event. And they're called prediction markets because the idea is that the price is a prediction. So one could be, you know, what will the price of Apple close at on a certain date? Uh, you could have ones on the presidential elections, how much rainfall will fall in a certain location, um, basically anything you could think of. Um, one of the more popular use cases in the past was a prediction market called Intrade. Uh, which had markets on political events. And so this is the uh, US presidential election with Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. And the market tends to be pretty accurate. It tends to be more accurate than other sources like polling. And so there's like a huge range of things you could use this stuff for. Um, like anything, any future event that you could speculate on could be viewed as a prediction market. Uh, you could sort of view the stock market as a prediction market you can read the CME, CBOE, commodities markets, futures markets as being prediction markets. Uh, it's really kind of an academic buzzwordy word, the concept of a prediction market. But it's basically generic financial markets on anything. And on Ethereum, we're doing synthetic ones. So markets that are not based on any actual underlying asset. You know, there's no like, if you have a market on the election, there's no like physical election that you're buying and selling, but you're basically betting on what will happen. And so what is a decentralized prediction market? This is sort of the idea that you could create one of these uh, where no one actually did any, any, any individual piece. So there's no central custodian of funds. There's no one person that executes the trades. There's no central market creator, no market make, central market maker, no central counterparty, no person who resolves all the markets. Everything is all peer-to-peer -peer from end to end, including you know, the UI itself all the way to the settlement layer that takes place on the smart contracts on Ethereum. So you could sort of have global liquidity in markets on anything, anywhere. And so how does one of these markets work? Well, you really have three components. You have creating the market itself, trading on those markets, and then you have how do you actually resolve the market, how do you do the payout. That's the sort of the concept of like, if the election happened, how do you know who won when there's no one person who's gonna say who actually won? And that last piece is actually what we spent most of the time on solving uh, for Augur. It's actually the hardest problem, but I'm not going to go into it in this talk because it's super kind of lengthy and actually fairly convoluted how, how we solve that. But if you're interested in it, you can just Google Augur white paper and it explains it. And this is basically Augur v2. So this is what the UI looks like. So we made a decision basically to launch again um, with a more trading focused UI, uh, mostly because the interesting markets in the beginning tend to be political markets, um, crypto markets, things like that, where the main users are traders. Um, over time, as we saw some of the underlying scalability issues, things like latency, transaction throughput, then it becomes much more interesting to go after betting. Um, but the, the requirements of those users are pretty different. 
because most betting takes place during a game. So if a team scores a point during a game, you need to have the ability to modify your orders really quickly, um, like think a, a second or two. And if you can't, you'll basically lose money. But for betting on an election before the election happens, you don't have that technical constraint. It's not as big as an issue. And so that's kind of why it's tailored towards trading in the beginning. The interesting thing about Augur is no one person actually creates all these markets. So these are all user created. And a user can basically go to the site, create a market, um, we kind of dial into an example. This is like the sign up flow. Uh, in V1, it was pretty difficult. In V2, um, due to new wallet providers in the space, you can sign up with things like email, Gmail, phone number, uh, MetaMask. If you want, you can also use things like a ledger or Trezor if you're more hardcore. And so this is what an actual market looks like. Uh, it's pretty much a pro trading interface. If you've ever used Coinbase Pro, it feels very familiar. Uh, you have the order book, you have trade history, you have the different outcomes you can bet on. So in this case, it's an example market on the 2020 election. Uh, the highlighted outcome is yes. And so if you wanted to place a yes bet, in this example, you're basically buying 200 shares of Trump at I think 38 cents a share. And so if you were to win, you would win basically $200. Your total cost here is $76. So you're basically betting $76 on Trump. If he loses, you lose your money. If he wins, you get $200 back. And so in this example, it's basically placed a trade, the order is filled. Uh, these aren't mockups, they're actually just screenshots from using the app. Uh, that's how it actually looks. And so one thing that is kind of inter interesting to think about that nobody's really done before is you can have different user interfaces on top of the same underlying markets. So on Augur today, there's, there are markets on like sporting events, for instance, and they look very similar to those trading markets as they showed before. But you also have sites like Betfair, which show sporting events with a very different uh, lens for how you'd actually look at the underlying market. Uh, in Betfair's case, this is the sports book view. And so they're basically showing you decimal odds. So if you look at like this, um, one of these matches, uh, like the Tigre match, uh, if you bet on the Tigre team, you're gonna get 26.0 odds. So for every dollar you bet, you'll win $26 if that team wins. It's a different way of viewing the same underlying markets. This is the Betfair Exchange UI. And this is where people are basically, so there's one, one thing to mention is that for betting, there's two ways to bet. There's the bookie model or the sports book approach where you're basically betting against one actor. And the way to think about it is, imagine if when you went to go trade Apple stock, you weren't actually trading in a marketplace, but instead your brokerage, say E-Trade for example, took the other side of every single bet. That's how a sports book works. And so they have perverse incentives. They do things like cut users off, if you start winning, they'll delete your account. Uh, if you start winning, they may not actually pay you out to begin with. Or the more simple answer is if you start winning, they'll limit the amount you can bet. And it's so, like if you're actually good at betting, and you go to one of these sports books, usually within like three or four bets, if you know what you're doing, they'll cut your limits down. So say when you start betting, they'll let you bet $1,000. Three bets in, you may be down to $10. Six or seven bets in, you may be down to like 10 cents. Um, it, they're very aggressive. And so it's like, imagine if you were good at trading stocks and E-Trade cut you off and said, no, never mind, uh, you're winning money from us. That's sort of how sportsbooks works. So there's an alternative model called the exchange model. And that's where you're basically trading against the market. There's really one main exchange today, which is called Betfair. And Betfair has problems too. For instance, the most profitable market makers on Betfair, they're paying 40% uh, in fees. If you go to Betfair, it looks like the fee is like 2%. But if you're a winner and you're trading a lot of volume on their site, they have this thing called the premium charge. Almost nobody knows about it. Uh, it sounds like I'm making it up. And many people do say you're making it up when I say this. But if you go read their terms of, terms of service, somewhere like really deep in, it's like 50 page document in really fine font, it says they have this premium charge that they charge 40% of your profits if you're a really profitable active trader. And so the markets tend to be, well, they're not as liquid as they could be because of this huge fee. 
and it's definitely super rent seeking. There's other sites like Pinnacle, which have much higher limits. Uh, Pinnacle's based offshore, it's based in uh, Curacao, and, but it's also the sportsbook model, so you can bet against them, uh, but you can't actually bet with other people uh, in a marketplace. Betfair and Pinnacle are probably the two most well-known betting sites. Uh, you have other ones as well, Bet365, which is pretty popular in China, uh, but I'd say Pinnacle is probably one of the largest ones in terms of volume. They're also some of the best, uh, so they have one of the best teams of odds makers and market makers. Uh, it's very rare that Pinnacle would actually cut your account off, even if you're winning, because they're what's called a market maker book. So they're basically using, um, say, say you're basically taking money from Pinnacle, you're winning. What they'll do is they'll keep letting you do that because they want to improve the odds they offer to everybody else. Uh, so it's kind of a nicer model than most of the other books, uh, but there's still various downsides. Um, they still sometimes limit people if they're betting really high sizes, and it's not actually an exchange. And you can't create markets on what you want. It's only the set of markets that Pinnacle themselves offers. And so after V2, we're going to launch Augur V3, which is basically much more scalable. So what Augur V2 does is it uses 0x, uses 0x mesh. Uh, the reason we hadn't used 0x in the past is because mesh didn't exist. Now that it does, we can basically have entirely peer-to-peer -peer decentralized passing of orders uh, across the network that enables basically people to place and cancel orders very quickly um, on Augur. The thing it doesn't enable still, though, is fast settlement. And this is important because betting requires pretty low latency. And so, you know, we're kind of looking for some scalability solution to solve that problem, looking a lot at things like Matic Network and rollups to basically solve that issue. But once it's solved, we can then launch a betting UI. Um, so when people always say, oh, why is Augur UI so hard to use? It's not because we don't know how to build a betting UI. It's because we could build it, but the user experience would be really bad without these underlying scale issues being solved. And so that's sort of what we're looking to do next is release the betting exchange UI where we can sort of fix the betting market. Um, where today, most profitable bettors get banned. They get shut off, they get rejected from these books, they can't place their bets. And on something that's peer to peer, that's an actual exchange, they could. And so the thing I would kind of, the main like takeaway I would say is, if you think of betting today, it doesn't really feel like finance, but there's no reason it couldn't. Um, it's sort of a different asset class. It's synthetic, it is zero sum. So it's more like certain classes of derivatives that are zero sum. Um, but there's lots of practices in betting that would never fly in finance. For instance, when you place an order, the market maker on any betting site can cancel, if you try to take an order off the book, they can cancel within five seconds. If that happened in equities markets, uh, the SEC would basically go after you because that would be uh, essentially spoofing. Um, but in sports betting, it's kind of normal and, and, and a part of the market. And so the idea is that you could have this market be much more efficient, much more liquid, um, which much more fairer rules actually if you were to make it peer-to-peer -peer and change the sort of economic model. They also have these things called rollover requirements, which is like if you bet $100 to withdraw out of your account, you may need to bet it five more times. Uh, five more times, the average person just loses all their money. Uh, so it's kind of like these like, tricks that the bookies use uh, to basically separate a customer from as much money as possible. And so this is what the Augur betting exchange looks like. Uh, it's actually much easier to understand than the trading UI. Um, you're basically choosing one of the teams that you want to back or bet on. You choose the stakes, so you say you want to bet $10. At odds of six, for instance, would give you $60 if you win. So it's much simpler uh, than the trading interface. And that's basically it. I was gonna go over some other stuff, but we're, we're sort, of, sort of out on time. But I think the main takeaway is using 0x, we're able to fix the main problems in Augur V1, which is that it was impossible, maybe not impossible, almost impossible to profitably market make because of the fact that every order took place on chain. So it was super slow, super expensive, and uh, really difficult to profitably market make on Augur V1. 0x basically changes that. Uh, which should, I think, increase volumes, trading volumes, because now market makers can go to Augur and refresh their orders every so often using 0x instead of actually doing multiple transactions on-chain to update, update their prices. 
And so Punchline is we're looking to launch Augur V2 in a few weeks once we get through some final kind of stages of performance testing using 0x mesh. Thanks. <laughs>